In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is born. Lord, so King Herod is not only an historic figure, he is also a metaphor for the mind that is out of control. In other words, an impure mind. From impure minds come impure thoughts, and from impure thoughts comes suffering. We call it in Christian lingo, sin. It boils down to this. Sin is anything that causes suffering in others or in ourselves. In the case of Herod, his impurity and out-of-control mind led to the massacre of innocent children. This is why we are taught by our Orthodox fathers and mothers to carefully watch what is going on in our minds. They call it vigilance of soul, which in fact, if you pay attention, is something we specifically pray for in the Divine Liturgy. Listen for it. Grant us, we pray, vigilance of soul. So vigilance, watchfulness, awareness, consciousness, sacred mindfulness, call it what you will, <coughs> is the narrow path of the Christian life. When we are vigilant, our lives become more peaceful as we abandon what is unwholesome and cultivate the good. Thoughts are like seeds. If you plant flower seeds, you get flowers. Plant poison ivy, and guess what you will get? Good trees, Jesus tells us, cannot produce bad fruit. So we must be careful what kinds of seeds we plant in our hearts and minds so that from us only good things will come. Our thoughts, writes the elder Thaddeus, determine our lives. One of the unhealthy seeds in Herod's mind was fear. He feared the loss of his power and his throne to a helpless infant at that. Fear, which has the power to narrow minds and harden hearts, robbed Herod of any sense of decency and morality, led him to believe that his welfare, his power, his throne was more important than the welfare of babies and children. We do not know the recipe of Herod's life, so we are left with many unanswered questions. What drove him to such extremes? What was the burden of pain he carried within that made such evil possible? What trauma did he experience in his life to make him so paranoid and insecure? It must have been severe. Here is a truth we would all be most wise to remember. And Jack Cornfield says it like this. I quote, Pain is not pro that is not processed is passed on. Pain that is not transformed is transmitted. End quote. Those who are tormented often become tormentors, is another way to put it. And Richard Rohr puts it like this. If you don't transform your own suffering, you will transmit it to others. And the very point of repentance is the transformation of suffering into joy. I can never forget what I once read in a book on orthodox spirituality that struck me. It was this, quote, An angry monk in his cell is like a snake spitting poison on the world. Certainly, we do not want to be like that angry monk. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it, John writes of Christ. Vigilance is a lamp. The light that it illumines, that, that it carries, is Christ. The eye of the soul is the aperture through which the light enters into the very heart of our own personal and corporate darkness. When the aperture is open, then the transformation begins and the darkness is transfigured. 
Repentance is the word that encompasses this whole miraculous process. Undoubtedly, there is much in all of us that needs transformation. The deep and authentic spiritual practice that brings real transformation calls for courage. The courage to see ourselves. The courage to love ourselves. The courage to open our hearts wide to allow the Holy Spirit to come and transform our pain into joy and to make us a blessing to the entire world. What comes from the transfigured soul is light. What flows from the transfigured believer is rivers of living water. The light and that water are meant to flood the entire world. In closing, I must put in a plug for the kind of prayer whose very center is the practice of vigilance and mindfulness. That is contemplation and meditation. Let me give you an example, actually two examples. An interviewer once asked Mother Teresa what she says to God when she prays. She replied, I don't say anything. I just listen. Then the interviewer asked her what God says to her. She answered, he doesn't say anything. He just listens. And if you don't understand that, she went on, I can't explain it to you. This is the perfect prayer. The prayer of vigilance. The prayer of attentiveness. The prayer of listening, of openness. The prayer of absolute faith in the presence of God at the very moment you pray. The kind of prayer that heals and transforms. And this is the path we all must take. Second example, Metropolitan Nancy Bloom tells a similar story in his wonderful book, Living Prayer, which I recommend to you. A French priest noticed that an older man came almost daily to his empty and quiet church and just sat in the pews for the longest time. One day, he mustered the courage to ask him, Sir, what do you do when you come to the church? He replied simply, I look at him, and he looks at me. That is perfection. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.